Okay, so uh, just so people know how to get to the new content this year, first of all, if you want to download the latest version, you can go to quorumlanguage.com and then you can click on the download link and or navigate to it with uh, VoiceOver or MEDA or whatever you're using. Uh, and then there's two versions. There's a Windows version and a Mac version of Quorum Studio. And you, there's a button under that label download that you can select to go and download the stuff and then install it. Okay, if you wanna see the release notes, there's all sorts of details about it that I won't go into. If you wanna to get to the new tracks that we're using for Epic, you go up to the lear to learn. And then you see a picture of Jill Dunaway, which, uh, uh, she's, I see her in the chat, so sorry, Jill. Um, and then uh, you can scroll down and or go down to the bottom and there's a, a value on the learn page that says data science professional development track. And that then it says in this track, engage in a one week professional development workshop at Epic on data science, including learning about charts, data frames and descriptive statistics. When you go to that, you get to our track page for data science. And there's, you'll notice that there's 15 lessons on all sorts of topics. Uh, introduction to spreadsheets in Quorum Studio, introduction to programming, loading tidy data frames, which we'll get to, overview of chart types and examples, and et cetera. And we're gonna go to the first one, which is Introduction to Spreadsheets and Quorum Studio. And we'll, we'll go through this all in a minute. Um, but so before I go, can I get in Slack, hopefully, um, from anybody that's new especially, have you been able to install everything? Are you good to go? Is there any problems getting stuff set up? So I know there's a, new, a few new faces today. Okay. All right, so let's start by actually not using Quorum Studio at all. And instead, we are going to make, okay, great. We are going to make a uh, spreadsheet. And a lot of what we do in data science is programming, but only sort of. And when I say that, what I mean is that oftentimes in data science, what we're really trying to do, okay, that's great, Tammy, is um, we're trying to make, you know, some kind of decision. Is a vaccine safe? Is a drug going to work? Right? And for whom? Right? Is a car reliable? Right. And those are kind of complicated questions that might have a lot of nuance to them. And oftentimes what they do is they require that we gather data. And so one of the things to learn about first is I want everybody to open a text editor, just a plain old crappy, whatever text editor you have on the system, on your system. And I'm going to open one too. And for Epic, we are going to, I'm going to share a screen real quick just so you can see it. Nah, where is it? There's the button. Okay, I'm going to pull up text edit, but it doesn't really matter. We're going to be using as our data store CSV files, comma separated value files. And the name implies what they are. And we're not going to write these by hand, but I want to show you what they are by hand because that gives you a sense of what Quorum actually reads in, or really any data science tool reads in stuff like CSV. Now, I will tell you, although I'm, we're going to use these for Epic, in practice, what you need to do to store data and to load it in and stuff like that is a very complicated topic. I mean, it's something that people get PhDs in, right? But 
oftentimes in data science, we use these small little CSV files because it's good enough, right? Like it, it's actually a sufficient amount of data. Even if it was like 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 data rows, that's really not that big of a deal. It's really only when you get giant files like petabytes or multiple gigabytes that you wouldn't want to store it in this format anymore, where you'd want to kind of do something fancier, if you will. So let's make a CSV file. So if everybody can load a text editor, and what we're going to do is we're just going to write first a header row. And so I'm going to make two columns of data. So I'm going to make mine, let's see, car and driver. I know nothing about cars. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to call programming and person. Okay. And the first row is actually programming and person in our spreadsheet, which this is a spread is basically a spreadsheet and it's separated by a comma, right? Now, when a programming language like R or Python or Quorum reads this in, normally it's going to interpret that first row as the name of a column in a spreadsheet, the name of a column. And then if I press enter, any row past it is the data. Okay. So if this case, if it's one, comma five, so programming comma person on the first line, and then one comma five on the second line, believe it or not, that is a CSV file, a comma separated value file. And, and you can, if you, re, if you write just that, you can read that in as a data set. Okay. But of course, in practice, that sounds super tedious. So we don't do that. And instead what we do is we use a spreadsheet. So I'm pulling up Excel and you don't have to use Excel. You can use whatever you want to use, numbers, Google Sheets. Um, for accessibility, I think Excel does a generally a good job, but there are many kinds of spreadsheet applications and any of them, pretty much any of them can make a CSV file because it's so simple. Now, if I wanted to make my spreadsheet map exactly, I can say programming person, and I put programming in column A, and I put person in column B. And then if I said one, five, I would actually have the same value. If I save my file, which I'm going to do right now, put it on my desktop. Ah. It's gonna use an Excel format or other applications have their own formats. But what I wanna do, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see this, hopefully you can, because it's on the shared screen. I'm gonna go up to, if I'm in Excel, I'm gonna to go to save as and in an Excel workbook, one of the options is CSV or .CSV. And so the very first thing that I would like to do is I'd like to make sure that everybody can make a CSV file from whatever application they want. And I don't want to continue on until we're all on that same page, just because we're going to need to do that more than once during Epic this week. So I'm going to go make one. And then I'm going to save that on my desktop. And Excel sometimes will complain that you're going to have data loss and we don't care. That doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to, I have my CSV file and I can load it up and et cetera. So can everybody give me kind of an indication as to whether they can make a CSV file? I think this is probably a relatively simple task, but I just want to make sure that everybody can do it because we might run, you know, if we can't, it is better to, to figure it out now so that we can get it going. Anybody, I see one thumbs up from Sarah Larkin. See some other thumbs. 
it sounds like everybody's good. Okay. All right, great. So if you look on the actual lesson, that will show up, yep. If you look at the actual lesson, there's some examples of a CSV file. And so just to kind of highlight it, in the particular one online, it says Daniel, Seattle, Purple, Rocky Road, Brandon, Las Vegas, Blue, Vanilla, and it, some other stuff. You'll notice that this is not all numbers and data science often isn't. Data science often has complex data to, to manage and it can be all sorts of stuff. But really the point of this example is just that there's five rows and then four columns. And this column and row thing is gonna come up over and over again because we're gonna represent our data always as what's called a quote unquote tidy format. And really that's just a very specific way to format your CSV files. It, it, in computer science parlance, they often call it opinionated, which means you certainly don't have to format your data this way, but if we all agree to do it, then it's, it's easier for the programs to load it up and manage it and stuff like that. We'll get to all that in just a second. Okay, now besides that, the next thing that we're gonna jump to is we're gonna actually start taking a look at Quorum Studio. Now, the purpose of this particular session is just to make sure that anybody that hasn't come to Epic before, and there is a few, can anybody that hasn't come before kind of like, you know, thumb up or something like that, just so I kind of know. I think it's only a few, a few, a few people. So I just want to make sure that if you haven't come before that you feel comfortable. And so I want to kind of walk you through the offline environment and then we can talk about the online environment as well. So this is an example of what uh, Quorum Studio looks like. This particular one is on a Mac, uh, but on PC, it looks quite similar. And you'll, you'll notice, and you can browse this with a screen reader if that's your uh, preferred modality. Um, that there are quite a few options and parameters and stuff like that. And I just kind of want to walk through them so that everybody feels comfortable doing stuff. So first let's kind of go through the menus and then we're going to go through and make a sample program just so that we can ha have written one. And then we're going to go through some of the hotkeys offline and online so that we're, we're good to go. There. So first of all, uh, Quorum Studio has a whole bunch of menus and inside of them, uh, you've got file, edit, view, navigate, run, team, windows, and help. I usually audio describe just because I don't know uh, anybody that who will be here and who will not. In the file menu, you can uh, you can make and close projects. And whenever I do a new computer program, I make a project for it, and then I can uh, adjust it. This also lets me like open projects, save, stuff like that. In the edit menu, it's all the traditional stuff you'd expect in a text editor, like undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, stuff like that. The only other one that I want to point out is at the very bottom of uh, the menu, there's one called Edit Quorum Studio Properties. And you can also press Control-Alt-P, at least on Mac. Uh, the Windows hotkey, I, I forget. And if I do that, it pulls up a window that says Quorum Studio Properties. If you'd like to put in a username and a password there, you can, although it doesn't really do anything at the moment because we, we don't require the uh, logins to get updates anymore. But then also there's a thing that says color mode and you can change to light or dark mode in that window. If you do that, you have to restart the actual environment in order to do it. Mildly annoying that you have to restart, but you do for reasons. Okay. Besides the edit menu, there's view, and inside of that, you you have zoom keys. So I can press uh, Command Plus, kind of like a, a browser, and it will get bigger and smaller. It zooms uniformly, and it shouldn't rasterize at any levels. So you can go quite small, and you can go quite large, depending upon your needs. Uh, during the event, if you need me to zoom it in, just let me know. There's a navigate window, and that lets us do things like jumping around. This is especially useful for screen reader users, but uh, I use it pretty religiously as well. There's a go to line key where you can go to a new line in a text editor. 
Uh, there's a previous action and next action. We'll get to what that means later as we code, but essentially it's a, you can jump to positions in the code. Uh, if you've used Quorum Suit before, we actually had to change those keys for this release because we figured out that they were actually conflicting with certain JAWS keys. So uh, the previous and next actions are now control page up and control page down if you're an expert already. There is a run menu where you can build, clean, clean and build, run, debug, stop. And so I'm going to go over what each of those are, but I'll do. I'll wait just a second because it's on the toolbar too. Um, those are like to run programs. Uh, well, no, I guess I could do that now. So in the run menu, there's a lot of buttons and these have actually changed from the previous version. So on the toolbar, there's a hammer and the hammer means build. This means make my program. There's a little medicine thingy bob, or I don't know what it's called, like a, I don't know, hand cleaner, sanitizer. I don't know, something like that. And that thing is clean and build. Clean and build means get rid of anything that's on disk, totally blow it away, and then remake it from scratch. You don't, don't generally need that very often, but um, it's there if you do. There's a play button, which runs your program. There's a cute little bug. Well, I'm told it's cute by a five-year-old, no, not five-year-old, my 10-year-old tells me that it's cute. A little bug to run the debugger. This is for finding errors in your code. We'll go into that later. There's a red stop button and that stops your program. If you're in the debugger, you can pause your program so you can see what it's doing at any given time. And then there's some other controls for running the debugger. There's continuing forward. There's an arrow and a right arrow. That means step over a thing. You can step into certain things. You can step out of things. And if you've never used a debugger before, don't get too freaked about it. It's not that tough, but you know we'll go over that kind of stuff later. The point is you can basically stop your program and then run it piece at a time to see what it's doing, which can be helpful. Now, besides those things, there's some extra options like uh, sending your code to an Android device or sending your code to a, an iPhone, stuff like that, that are in that menu. There's a team menu for managing Git. Git is a um, version control system for managing your files. We won't go into it a lot this particular year uh, because we're not using a separate repository for it, but uh, it is there. We do use it on the team quite a bit. And there's a Windows menu to kind of jump around, do stuff like that. And then a help menu that uh, doesn't do a tremendous amount. It just kind of, you know, has the about page and stuff like that. Which, by the way, I think Amanda Rada found a bug in and I did fix that so, because there was some accessibility issues. In any case. <laughs> Uh, so that's the core of the user interface uh, the, on the menus and stuff. Besides that, you'll also notice that there is a series of tabs on the bottom. There's a console tab, and this is where when your program runs, if you tell it to output something, it puts it there, and it's a normal text box. There's an errors button. If your program has an error in it, you might think that that sounds scary, and it can be, I guess. But the truth of the matter is, if the computer can automatically find your errors, that's where it's finding them. And so it's a lot easier to figure out what's going on with your code if the computer finds an error compared to if there's something it can't figure out, which happens. There's a variables tab if you're running in the debugger. Breakpoints we won't get into yet, but it's again related to the debugger, the same as this call stack thing. And then finally, there's this button called search results or you can do like find type operations in the environment. Okay. Any questions so far, or can we make a, a quick program so that we can kind of get started with Hello World? Everybody good? Okay, I see no gnashing of teeth. All right, so then using the keyboard or the mouse, we're gonna go up and we're gonna make a project. So I'm gonna press Alt, and I can uh, press Alt F, oops, not that one. Ah. And that's the mnemonic if you prefer the keyboard. And inside of that, there is a command for new project and it's also command N. So I can press that hotkey as well. 
And all of those pull up the same window, which is a project window. And inside of this window, there's all sorts of different kinds of projects that we can make. And I'll mention them all briefly, just so you know what they are. There's two general projects. There's blank, which makes literally a blank file for you to type code into. There's main, which just kind of sets up some default things for your program to do. There is a graphic set. There's one called game, which makes a, a game application. We're actually not doing games at all this week. Uh, games are kind of a complicated topic. There's one on image sheets, which has to do with 2D games. There are two physics games that can be generated by default and one for a skybox, which has to do with kind of like 3D terrain-ish type things. Quorum has its own scene editor, so you can actually make 2D and 3D games and it's still accessible, I promise, we do our best. So, and that's, you can make those. There is a Lego, Thing for generating Lego content. And that's related to the Lego Mindstorms, which is the older toolkit. Uh, and then finally, there's a few others like for generating Android devices, document, internet services, sine waves, UIs, stuff like that. Those can be expanded over time. But what we're going to do is we're going to go to general blank. And we're going to navigate to the thing and we're going to give it a name. And I'm going to give it uh, my blank app. And then I'm either going to tab to the OK button or I'm going to press Enter. I'm just going to press Enter. Now, when I do that, it's going to make the application. And then uh, I can go to the tree. There's a tree. And I can do that in a couple of different ways. But one is Command-1. It's pressing the wrong key or something. Anyway. And inside of that, I can then traverse my app. And there's some files in here. It says the name of my application, which is my blank app. It says source code, which is just a folder on my hard drive. And then it says main.quorum, which is an actual source file for me to use. And in addition, I can also get the properties for my project. There isn't going to be many, but I can either do that through the menu or I can press Command P. And it pulls up this super complicated window that I don't need to know about, honestly. But basically, it lets you adjust all sorts of funny stuff about your project if you want to. Generally, we won't need it uh, for this week. So then I'm going to open my file. I'm going to go down to main.quorum and I'm press Enter. And at this point, I'll ask again, has everyone been able to get to this spot? Because now we're actually going to write code. Is anybody lost? Hearing nothing, I think people are good. Lots of thumbs up. Lots of thumbs up, okay, great. All right, so at this point then, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write my first program. Well, it's not my first program, but our first program for Epic 2022. And it's going to be an output statement and then it's going to say, hello world. And you'll notice a few things off the bat. One is you'll notice that the word output has a color to it. There's a space between the T and the, the, the text value that comes after it. So it's all lowercase, O-U-T, P-U-T, space, and then a double quote. And then any phrase that you want, I put hello world, and then a double quote at the end. Output is a keyword, meaning it's a special reserved word in a programming language that is used for sending data out. And then this uh, double quoted thing is text. It's text. And if I want to run that, there's a bunch of ways I can do it. One is I can go up to the run menu. I can click build, and then I can click run. If I don't want to do that, I can just go to run and then press run. So I don't actually need to build it. It builds it automatically. I can also mouse over to the toolbar, or you can get there through the keyboard to the um, 
play button. I can click the play button and it will do it. Or you can press on Mac, Command R, and on Windows, Control R, and it will do the same thing. Now, in terms of the hotkeys, I would recommend memorizing just a couple of them. One of them that I would recommend uh, memorizing is the Command R key so that you can just quickly bash your program and tell it to run. If you're a screen reader user or you have students that use the keyboard for their primary modality for uh, any number of reasons, they're power users, they have mobility impairments, they, have, they use screen readers, whatever it is, then I recommend at least memorizing some of the navigation keys to get around in a program. And we have a hotkey guide for Quorum Studio, which I will link into Slack. And I'll share that really quick, just so you can see what it is. I'm not going to go over all the different hotkeys because that's kind of a, a waste. But you'll notice that it has all the hotkey menus, the edit menus listed, all the all the different menus, all the different hotkeys that you can use for running and stopping your programs. And technically, Quorum Studio will tell you these too. But my point is that if you are using the keyboard as your primary modality, I would at least have somebody memorize the Windows menu keys because that lets you jump around easily. And definitely some of these run keys. Those are kind of important for just kind of being comfortable in the environment if you're a keyboard user, if you're a keyboard user. If you're a mouse user, to be honest, I still use them anyway because they're very convenient. But uh, if you're a keyboard user especially, you want to memorize at least a handful, five to 10 of them is, is very helpful. OK. So I press Command R and I have run a program. Ta da. OK. So I've got something. And when, I, uh, when I've done that, you'll notice at the very bottom of my screen, it pulls up this thing that says, building my blank app. Oops, what is the key for that? I forget it. Uh, Command 3. OK. And if I press Command 3 or Control 3 on Windows, you can jump to that, and that's a text editor. So even if you're using a screen reader, it will read it to you uh, on Windows, at least. And the, the lines are building my blank app. That's just telling you that it's doing a build. And then it says it's running my blank app. It says how long it took to build it, build successful in 0 0.01 seconds. And then past that, it tells you the output of your program, which in this case was Hello World, because that's what I told it to do. I said, output, hello world, and then it actually output that to the system. So similarly, if I added another statement, oops, output I again, and I ran it, it would say, hello world, and then I again. So you can actually write basic computer programs, and you can have them output to the screen. OK. Now, I know for some of you that have done this before, this is kind of old hat. But for some of you that may not have before, this is kind of the core of what you need to know to kind of get started. There's a new project button that you can go into. It has a source code file. And you type stuff into that source code file. And then you press a couple keys. And that runs your code. And that's kind of the, the crux of it. Now. The next thing I want to do, just to make sure that you understand sort of what some of these keys are, I want to also give kind of a, a little demo of how we're going to manage some of the accessibility content in terms of keys. Because part of this is just making sure people are comfortable with hotkeys or exposed to it ahead of time. So we're going to go to one other page. And that is our reference page. I'll share a screen in a second, but I just want to make sure it's in here. And inside of this reference page, I'm going to show, oh, no, I can't do that. I need to actually share sound. I want to point out exactly where all this content is that you, we're going to use over here. So oftentimes, we're going to reference other tutorials. So uh, you'll notice that there's an introduction set of tutorials on this reference page. 
It has the hotkeys that I just linked, a getting started for Quorum Studio, and then a bunch of programming tutorials, coding guidelines, types and variables. There's an advanced Quorum set, which is like using libraries, inheritance, generics, and stuff like that. You don't need to know what all these are, but I'm just pointing out that it's there. There's a series of separated tutorials on all sorts of content, uh, five on basic 2D graphics, graphics in two dimensions, um, four on user interaction and events, like moving the mouse, the keyboard, how you manage stuff like that, five on 3D graphics, drawing and lighting. There's seven tutorials on how you have computer games with physics in them. There's nine tutorials on how you use the scene editing system. Again, we're not going over all this in this year. We can't, like there's no way that we could do all of this one year anyway. Um, there's three on other kind of esoteric graphics things. There are 10 tutorials on audio programming. Uh, Quorum has everything from MIDI to uh, digital signal processing engines. There are 17, wow, and actually we could do more. 17 tutorials on user interface design in Quorum. These all use the updated looks and feels now. Six on Lego programming in Mindstorms. Seven on reading data in this format called JSON. And then finally, we get to all the new data science tutorials outside of the uh, stuff for Epic. So this includes seven on data science in general. This is like introducing data science, data frames, which we'll get to this funny thing called tidy, uh, CSV files, loading files, saving data. Uh, seven on transforming data. This is like uh, replacing values, deleting rows, anything like that. Kind of like manipulating a spreadsheet, but through a program. We, we often want to do that to make it so that it's reliable. Um, there's 11 on descriptive statistics content. All of this is relevant for um, high school for sure, or pretty much. Mean, median, and mode, variance of standard deviation, interquartile ranges, uh, standard deviations from the mean, often called a z-score in statistics, uh, and then concepts like skew and kurtosis. Uh, a lot of that kind of content is used uh, commonly in uh, high school. And then we've got a whole bunch of tutorials on charts, 15 of them. And so far in Quorum, uh, we, there's a thing on keyboard navigation, but there's also a bunch of tutorials on the different chart types that we support. And right now that includes bar charts, histograms, pie charts, line charts, scatter plots, box plots, and violin plots. Those are the ones that we have so far. It's possible that we'll add new chart types in the future. So if as a teacher, there's other kinds of chart types that you really want that you think you would use in the classroom, uh, let us know so that we know what kind of ones that uh, people would want, want to have. So, because um, that way we'll, we'll know what to target in the future. Okay, now besides this, I'm gonna pull up two things. One is the keyboard navigation, and I'm gonna pull up the bar chart tutorial as well. So first I'm going to look at the, the keyboard navigation. And you'll notice that just like the Quorum Studio one, there's all sorts of hotkeys that are available. And as a very first step, I'm going to just kind of highlight, I'm not going to make you do it, not yet, but I'm just going to highlight the kinds of things that you can do with charts and how it'll work accessibly. And then I'll show you, and I'll show you including with a screen reader so that you can see it. I'm going to be using Safari because I'm on my, my Mac, uh, but uh, it it works in NVDA and JAWS and all that stuff as well online. So you'll notice that there are a bunch of different chart keys for moving around. There's also specific chart keys for box and violin plots, histograms, bar charts, and stuff like that. So um, oh, I wonder what this one is. Oh, we'll pull up this one. Okay, let me, okay, perfect. We'll start with an easy one. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up Safari and I'm mean, sorry, voiceover. I'm gonna turn that on now. Voiceover on Safari. Keyboard controls and charts. Quorum programming language window. Edit text. Use libraries.compute.statistics.dataframe. Use libraries.interface.controls.charts.bar chart. Slash star. This is an example of how to read in data with data frames. Okay, I'm not gonna make it read the whole thing. But uh, like normal with any kind of Quorum environment. Slash slash create frame component. I can move around in my environment. Data slash new line. 
frame colon load data slash busiest misspelled airports.csv. <laughs> You'll notice that voiceover often doesn't understand code. So they say things like misspelled, which is not always true, but it is what it is. And if I New want line. to, oops, if I want to run my program, I can either go to the button, build control plus B, run control plus R button. You and are currently on a button. Something has changed in previous versions of Quorum. You would often go and you would navigate to these these canvases, but that doesn't that's not true anymore, uh, and that's because a canvas can run only once I've run a program. So I'm going to press Enter on my Run button. Output of development environment build successful. And you'll notice that Quorum has actually generated a chart uh, for me based on the code that's on the left hand side. And we won't get into that code yet because I don't want to go into that yet. I just kind of want to show you the kinds of ways that you're going to navigate stuff. And I want to make sure that anybody that is using a screen reader kind of knows that we've got some stuff planned so that they can ready. Yeah. Build, control, enter game button. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option, space. OK, so now if you have a uh, screen reader and you land on a chart inside of our environments online, when you land on them, they're going to say, enter game button. And I want to explain kind of what's going on here so that people don't get confused by it. What's happening here is that this is this sort of magical shadow DOM craziness. What's happening is that you've got a environment and in order for it to not keyboard trap in the right way, we want, we have a secret magic hidden button inside of this little thing online. And if I want, if I press enter to it, Game, web dialog, busy airports, bar chart with 26 total bars. Use the arrow keys to navigate chart information and tab to access the chart content. Web application. You are currently on a web app. And I'm going to cut it off a little bit. You'll notice that it tries to give you a summary of what's happening in the bar chart, kind of like a traditional alt description. Now if I press escape. Enter game button main. You are currently on a button to click this. It takes me back to the button, so I can always get out of Build, it. control plus B, button, run, control plus B, enter game, button. That you are way, currently on a button. That way, even if I'm a keyboard and screen reader user, I can always get in and out of these environments online, and I can use all the graphics content now, which you could never do before this year. Like, it's always been a very, you know, because like, how do you do graphics online and make it all accessible? It's a tricky thing. Now, believe it or not, this is also a running game. So if you are a teacher and you've been at Epic before and you've written 3D games and 2D games, you can do these in the browser accessibly too now. So that's a that's a brand new thing that we've got working nowadays through this magical kind of shadow DOM type system. Game, web dialog, busy airports, bar chart with 26 total bars. Use the arrow keys to navigate chart information and tab to access the chart content. Web app. Okay, so it gave me some information. It said that there was 26 total bars says I can use the arrow keys to navigate chart information. So let's try that. Busy airports, bar chart with 26 total bars. Use the arrow keys to navigate chart information and tab to access the chart content. Web application x-axis shows country and has values Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Netherlands. So you can see that if I, at this point in time, I've landed on the x-axis and it's gonna try to describe just it's almost like an alternate description just for the x-axis so that i can gather information about it if i press the arrows again y-axis shows count and ranges from 0 to 140 web application you are currently on a web application and so in the, uh, the y-axis it gives me the range and x-axis shows country and x y-axis shows count and ranges from chart area with 26 bars to navigate the chart press enter to move into the list of bars or shift tab to return to chart information if I press tab, I land on the chart itself, like the information, like the core bars of the bar chart. And I can press enter to go inside it. Australia bar 10, one of 26 bars. To navigate the list of bars, use the arrow keys to move between bars in list order. Use page up down to move between bars by value order. Use shift plus enter to return to the group list. Web application chart area with 26 bars to navigate the chart. Press. So I can now move across the bars in a couple different ways. I can press up, down, left, and right to move between the bars. And I can also press page up, page down to go from the smallest bar to the biggest bar. The idea is, and we, to be, to be blunt, we don't actually know that this is right, but we're experimenting. 
We're trying to give you different ways of interacting with these bar charts so that someone that can't see the bar chart can kind of get meaningful information from it. Okay. So if I move across. Brazil bar, six, two of 26 bars. Web application, Canada bar, seven, three of 26 bars. Web application. You are China bar, 50, four of 26 bars. Web application. So in this particular case, so I land on a bar, it says China bar 50. So China bar is the name of the bar. 50 is the value of the bar. And then it says four of 26 bars, kind of like you would hear in like a tree view or a list or something like that. France bar, seven, five of 20, in Japan, Republic of Korea. And you'll notice it's quite responsive. And this is because we've made progress on making graphics not just work, but also more um, speedy, I guess. I don't know what the right word would be for it. Like we've gotten better at helping the screen reader to know not just about graphics, but how to do it well, right? How to like give it the time it needs at the right time and have our application know what we need at the right time and stuff like that. Right, Spain bar, type, Tur United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom bar, United States bar, 121, 26 of 26 bars. Web application. You are currently on a- Now this is a relatively simple bar chart. These get these do get much more complicated and you can also interact with them in similar ways. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show you one more bar chart just to get- Bar charts, poor and program. Bar, you are currently on a text area. Output of development environment, build successful. Okay, now in this particular case, I've got a bar chart and it's gonna look, it's, it's got all sorts of bars in there. Enter game button. The data here doesn't matter. I just wanna highlight that even for very complex charts, this still is accessible. Build control plus B button. Enter game button. I say you are currently okay. on a button. I go in. Game, web dialog, bar chart with 12 groups and 84 total bars. Use the arrow keys to navigate chart information and tab to access the chart content. Bar chart with 12 groups and 84 total bars. Use the arrow keys to navigate chart information and tab to access the chart content. So you can see, even for very complex charts with like 84 bars, you're not gonna be able to describe this with an alternate description, at least not well, right? So instead what you can do is you can interact with it so that you can start to gather information. So for example, if I press left and right now, oops. Australia group, one of 12 groups, has seven bars. To navigate the list of groups, use the arrow keys. If I'm landing on the Australia group, this group actually has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different factors in there, and I can press enter again. Two long drinks bar, 28.3, one of seven bar, big dinner bar, 78.62, five of seven bars inside Australia group. Web application. You are currently on a web application. So the idea is that I can all, all of a sudden, I can uh, manipulate what's going on in the chart and gather information at any time. Australia group, Russia group, eight of two long drinks bar, 15 cinema entry bar, Russia group, eight of. So what I'm doing is kind of just navigating around. Okay. So there's a rough, window. oh wait, I should text field, here. voice over off. So there's kind of a rough sense of like the kinds of things that we're going to be doing this week. We're going to be doing some programming. Excuse me. We're going to be looking at some of the reference pages and stuff like that. And then we're going to be showing how you interact with um, the, the various charts and how you make them. And then once you've made them, we're going to be showing you how to kind of interact with them in a meaningful way online and offline. So. Okay, now for some of you that might have been old hat stuff and for some of you that might be all totally new. So let me kind of just open it up at this point for like uh, questions or thoughts or things like that. Since everybody's, everybody's camera's off for me and I never really know exactly whether people are still, uh, still engaged or what, what's going on. So let me kind of open it up for questions at that point. if people have any. So with the programming, is there a list of like commands and stuff that we'll get because I've never done this before. So do we have a list of commands, you know, just like in line to give us what we're looking for with the data? Yeah, uh, do you mean for the charts or do you just mean in general on the programming? Well, the charts or, you know, whatever we're using the tools for. So I guess just in general. Yeah, no problem. So there's 
a couple places to grab it from and I'll start. Are you on Slack, Tiffany? Yeah, I got the Slack pulled up. I just switched from my um, desktop from my computer to my phone so that I could be going through the navigation with you. So yeah. I think I'm, I saw, yes, I had the slide, the quorum Slack in here, I guess. It's got 124 people. <laughs> yeah, probably. So okay. um, I'll put it in Zoom too, but there's this reference page and that has just a ton of stuff. But if you look at it, it'll be overwhelming as a starting point. So okay. what what usually what we what we will do is we'll start going over some of the programming like step by step. So you kind of know where to look and at what times and stuff like that. But yes, there's a mountain of tutorials on exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. The hot key okay, what, you use. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, with the Slack, I'm just in hashtag general. Should I be somewhere specifically for this um workshop? Yeah, hashtag epic is where where hashtag. Yeah. So how, so I add bookmark and type in hashtag epic. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Okay. And if uh uh, I can toss stuff in general too. So let me put that reference page in general as well. Well, no, I'll, I'll hashtag epic. Yeah. So, yeah. And welcome if it's your first time coming. So it sounds like it is. Okay. It says, oh, I spelled it wrong. Yeah. E P I Q. It, it makes yeah. no sense, but it, it is what it is. So. Okay. So it just says nothing turned up. Nothing turned up. That's weird. Uh, maybe maybe I do. I need to add the channel. Oh, you know what? Uh, yeah, I just added you. Okay. Is this possible that there's? So, is there anybody else that's not in there? I could probably add people if they're not. I think that they're all public channels, so you can add them yourself too. So. Okay. Um, other questions, thoughts, concerns, whatever. I think I saw something from Mike. Mike said, no questions yet, but love the feel so far. So cool. Sounds good, Mike. Okay. Does this seem doable? We'll get to the code. The code's actually, if you haven't written data science code before, uh, it's weirdly much easier than a lot of the code that we've done in previous years because in previous years we've done lots of like games and stuff like that and games are actually pretty difficult to code whereas the data science stuff is it's much less code so it's it's quite a bit simpler so oh good glad tim yeah me too i like it as well okay so we have about 15 minutes before um uh uh linda's keynote so i would like to propose why don't we just do a little bit of coding and we'll kind of start jumping through it. Are people cool with that for 10 minutes? And then we'll maybe take a five minute break before Linda shows. Okay. So I'm going to jump back to Quorum Studio. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out and I'm just going to kind of wet people's interest for how you do all the data science type stuff. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to first, um, oh no, maybe I shouldn't start there. I'll, I'll start with what the next tutorial actually is, just so that people can kind of feel comfortable. And let's talk briefly about, no, 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 I think I will, because that'll, that'll, that'll make it okay. What I'm going to do is I want to have everybody go into their application, and I want you to type DA, T A F R E M E and then give it a name. And data frame is a type in the new quorum. And the name that you give it is just whatever you want. Okay. And this is a, an example of a type. And we will talk more about data frames, plenty, but I'm trying to kind of wet people's interest. And you'll notice, at least on my version, that when I do this, this little yellow bar shows up on the left-hand side. And if you're in a screen reader user, the uh, I think it 
it gives a little beep or something like that. I forget exactly what it does on Windows. It depends on the screen reader, but like it's it's told in a different way, but still. And what this is telling you is that you've got an error, but so like if I run Apple B, it's going to say I could not locate a type named data frame. But here's the thing: this little yellow jobber tells me that I can, that Quorum can figure out what you probably mean. So there's a way that you can tell it to auto fix. So if I right click or use the context menu, it'll say this funny command that says add use or libraries.computes.statistics.data frame. And if I select that, it's going to put in this statement above that says use libraries.compute.statistics.data frame. And I'll explain what that means really quick. Use is saying, I want my quorum program to know about some special thing. And then that special thing has a location and it's kind of like a web address, right? Like google.com. But in this particular case, there's a name called data frame and it lives at this special location. Okay. Everybody with me? I know that if you're new, this is going to seem kind of scary. But it's only two lines. And if you type it in exactly, I just want to make sure everybody can get that. The vast majority of what we're going to be doing for data science is going to be interacting with these data, this funky data frame class. This funky data frame class. Okay. Now, when I am done and I have these two lines, I'm going to say frame on the line below. I'm going to put in a colon. <laughs> hey, William, did we check that on the thing? It looks like that, that pop-up menu is still showing up smaller. I, I wonder if you should, we should check that in Quorum Studio. Um, you'll notice that the frame has like a gazillion different things that it can do. And we're not going to go over all of them. Copying, conversions, you can generate donut charts, you can generate all sorts of stuff. I'm just kind of scrolling through them. Histograms, line charts, removals, additions, all sorts of things. And what we're going to say is we're going to say frame colon to text. We're going to say output frame to text. And then I'm going to take this code and I'm going to copy paste it to Slack so others can copy paste it too. And then I'm going to run this code. And it's going to, if we did it correctly, it is going to do nothing. But I'm going to explain it so that we're ready to go with it. I've got a line of code that's saying I want to use the data frames. I'm declaring that I have a data frame. Data frame, frame, or Bob, or whatever you want to call it. And then I'm outputting anything in the data frame. And right now, that's nothing. OK. And so what this code is doing is it's telling us this data frame is basically a spreadsheet. That's the CSV thing here. So if I say frame colon, there's a special function called load from comma separated value. And I can take the code, the separated value that I wrote previously, copy paste it in. Obviously, we won't do this for most of our examples, but I'm just trying to give you an example from what we talked about. I can then have a code have code 
that loads in my custom spreadsheet. And again, I'll put this in Slack. So you can copy paste it. And what this code is saying is load in some data and then print it out. And I'm going to run it. Okay, so I'll go this line by line one more time. I have a thing called data frame. It lives somewhere. I'm going to make one data frame frame. I'm then going to load in something special, frame load from comma separated value. And then I'm going to print it to disk. Now, if you're wondering if you need to understand all this right now, no, you don't. We're going to get through some more step-by-step -step stuff. But I'm just trying to point out that what we're going to be doing over the course of this week is learning about these data frames, how we interact with them, and then how we load different kinds of things from them. How do we make a bar chart from data? How do we make a specialized line plot? How do we separate it out? How do we change the colors and all this kind of stuff? And this is really the core of what you're going to be messing with in terms of data science is interacting with these data frames and then printing out charts and graphs, stuff like that from within there. When we start again tomorrow, we're going to be starting more from the beginning, from uh, types and output operators and stuff like that. But this is really what we're going to get to within a day or so. So I'm just trying to whet your interest in, into the types of things that you'll be doing. OK. All right. So at this point, I want to, uh, if people have, oh, actually, I should stop the recording. <laughs>